This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In his essay, Why the Novel Matters, D.H. Lawrence argued that the novel contained all aspects of life. Perhaps even better place to make that claim is the epic. From tackling questions of identity, history, warfare, mortality, and the ways of the gods, to narrating tales of magic and supernatural creatures, it was the Greek and Roman poems of Homer and Virgil that underpinned and explained the position of men in the world. And it was these narratives of heroic actions and grand deeds that were to form a template from which many future epics would be constructed, from Chaucer's Troilus and Cressida to Milton's Paradise Lost to Joyce's Ulysses to John Ford's Westerns. But who are the heroes of these epics? To what extent was the classical epic a political project, a means of creating a founding myth for empire? How did the Renaissance revive the form, and how successful were writers such as Milton in rendering the Christian story an epic? And what do novels and films today owe to the epic? With me to discuss the epic are John Carey, Emeritus Professor of English Literature at Oxford University, Karen Edwards, Lecturer in English at Exeter University, and Oliver Chaplin, Professor of Greek Literature at Oxford University. John Carey, what exactly do we mean by the epic? Well, I think we use the term epic for the quite complicated fallout from three classical works, um, the two Homer poems and Virgil's Enid. And they have some things in common and some, in some ways they're very different, it seems to me. What they have in common is that they're about battle or the surround of battle and that it's not just battle but that the scope is cosmic supernatural gods and goddesses. It's not just a human battle, but something that relates to the cosmos. Um, secondly, they're related in a style that is quite unlike what the culture speaks. It's a high style, an exalted, transcendent style. It's taken out of everyday life. Um, thirdly, they're about maleness. I think, and about male bonding. And indeed, women are given a, a marginal or sometimes an oppositional role in them. So those are the things, I think, that they have in common, and those, those features go down, some of them, into later epics. In other ways, they're quite different, I think, in that the Iliad is a battle epic, um, the Odyssey is an adventure story, really, a very strange adventure story. I think the Odyssey is the original magic realist narrative. Magic realism comes from that, I think, um, with strange monsters and, and, and chantresses and so on, uh, interfering with a human story, which is human, um, in the end very human, um, when it is... Odysseus returns. And then the third of them, the Enid, is different again, I think, in that it's more distinctly a national epic, in some ways a very dangerous thing. It pits your culture as supremely destined against other cultures that will be obliterated. The fact that the, the Iliad, the Odyssey and the Enid are uh, in um, verse, does that mean that epics have to, very simply, does that mean that epics have to be in verse to be epics? I think that that gradually changes. That's to say my reading of how epic filters down through the ages would end up um, in Joyce's Ulysses, <laughs> and that, that's not in verse. It would, it would go through um, Tolstoy's War and Peace, and that's not in verse. But I take it that the epic began in song. I suppose that's the theory, that it was something that was not written down. Primary epic was sung. Uh, it was a social event of a particular What kind. evidence do you have for that, John? Hmm? What I, evidence I, I, well, I'm not a classicist, and I have only the evidence that, that classicists seem to say that that's how it was. But what the evidence, the linguistic evidence for that is, I don't know. We have a classical scholar, as it happens. <laughs> <laughs> to hand, uh, on my right, Oliver Taplin. What evidence is there for... John Carey has said it was sung and said that he's not a classical scholar. So you are. Was it? And if, if so, how do we know? Well, I suppose we know because these poems were created by poets who learnt how to be poets by listening to other poets. Writing was only just coming into Greece uh, at the time of Homer, 
in its very early days, about 700, Mm. when writing was extremely slow and extremely clumsy, and it wasn't until a couple of hundred years later that people could um, write sufficiently quickly or read sufficiently quickly for literature to become a a reading activity. Um, So it's a hearing activity, um, and poets uh, learn how to tell long stories by listening to other poets and picking up the techniques, and their audiences are educated in those techniques. So we're not into a reading culture, and there's, there's no way that these poems could have been created to be read. What are they saying? Um, what's, what's behind this, uh, Olo Taplin? Are they saying this is the way men, we have to stick the men for the moment, should live? This is an aristocratic society that I'm describing. These are our heroes. Are they, are they affirming the great principles or the great... Uh, objects they see of being alive and being a warrior and being a man at the time? Are they subverting it? What are they, in that crude, rather crude sense, sorry about that, what are they doing there? No, I mean, that is a very good question, and I think to some extent we inevitably read back into, if you like, its political uh, tendency, uh, our own reading of what we want it to be. I mean, there is, in a sense, there's a big divide between those who would say these poems telling the great stories of great humans of the past are bolstering aristocratic values. They're saying, stick with the good old rulers. They're the people who look after you. Um, Whereas one can put against that, you can say, well, actually, the the rulers in the poems are far from good role models. I mean, take Agamemnon. Spencer said Agamemnon is the example of the good governor. But actually, Agamemnon makes the most terrible hash of things. I mean, he's bad at judging morale. He alienates his best... uh, allies, um, and he ends up uh, humiliatingly having to climb down. He actually doesn't say anything in the whole of the last third of the Iliad. The last thing he says is, Achilles, I'm very, very sorry, I made a terrible mistake. Um, So uh, Odysseus, he's a sort of role model, uh, but he's not a role model for an aristocratic ruler, is he? He goes to to Troy with 12 ships full of men, over a 1,000 men, doesn't manage to bring one single one of those men home. So as a role model for, for an aristocrat who should look after a society, he's a role model for all sorts of other things, but not that. So I would want to say that these poems are actually questioning power structures. Um, I'm not saying this is a, exactly their primary purpose, but that, that at the same time as telling stories of human depth, they, they question uh, where power should lie, what kind of bonds is it that holds humans together, what kind of thing makes society stable, under what circumstances is it all right to be angry, Uh, Under what circumstances should you push revenge? Questions of this kind are implicit in what are at the same time very human stories. 600 years after Homer, just to take a little step forward, Karen Edwards, um, Virgil uh, writes the Aeneid under the Emperor Augustus, partly um, to please and uh, glorify, satisfy, celebrate the Emperor Augustus. Um, To what extent uh, was this, can you see this as a direct uh, successor to the Iliad and the Odyssey. Yes, I I wonder if one could even make an analogy. Um, It is often said that we have Christ's teachings uh, existing by themselves, but that it was Paul who turned the teachings of Christ into Christianity. And sometimes I wonder if one could say that about Virgil, that it was actually Virgil's perception that there was something called epic or that could be perceived as epic that was there to be built on that actually created what we now call epic. Why, can you just explain to people who are not, haven't got a grasp of it, well, like myself, right, uh, in what sense this was a political project? Why was it important for Augustus that this be done for him? Well, of course, he wanted to be praised, uh, as any autocrat might, and it was, uh, one wants to have one's deeds immortalized, and um, Virgil was recognized in his day as being an outstanding poet. Um, so one, that, that's understandable. Also, um, Augustus, as unconstitutional as he was, he saw himself, and, and rightly, as at least finally bringing an end to civil war, to the famine that was also produced by civil war and various kinds of uh, uh, poverty depredations that Italy had been subjected to because of that. Um, And I think that um, certainly Virgil was willing to admit that. He had grown up when Italy was really in terrible shape. At the same time, because Augustus was uh, so unconstitutional and had really ended uh, Rome as a republic, that also had to be registered, the pain of of loss. One could see uh, in the Aeneid 
in, in a way, Aeneas's renouncing of Dido as emblematic of what has to be given up in order to achieve... Dido's impact. one of the few interesting women in these epics, isn't she? Um, and Aeneas does the dirty on her, really, and she, uh, the abandoned woman, sacrifices herself on a pyre as he, he leaves. Um, the absence of women in epics, is that something that, what well, we have to register it, but what do we make of it? I'm not sure I completely agree that, uh, with John that epic celebrates maleness. I think very often... Uh, John did say that women are oppositional, but I think what they also do is to uh, point to the limitations of a male ethos. And I think it's, uh, it, to me, it's not surprising that I think typically the most, the, the favorite books of the Aeneid are those that involve Dido. I, I would agree with Karen on that, that there, there is a, it's more complicated than that. I mean, remember that the Iliad actually ends with the lamentings of the, tro of the three leading Trojan women for Hector. Uh, the poem actually ends with the, w the woman's voice, if you like. It's, while it is about the glory that can be won by war, it is also about the glory that can be won by human interactions like those between Hector and Andromache, like those between uh, Priam and Achilles, like Penelope in the, in the Odyssey. They win their glory too. Karen Edwards, you want to come in here? Well, I was, again, just to insist that epic does indeed complicate. It's one of the things that distinguishes epic from adventure story. But also, in terms of the question of maleness, it also depends on which epic you're talking about. It seems to me that epic also tends to shatter the, the, the mold. Each time an epic is, uh, is created, then it has to re-examine everything. And it seems to me that one of the crucial things that is re-examined is, is maleness, is a relationship between men and women. I mean, certainly, I would say in Paradise Lost, one could make an argument that the only whole entire human being in the poem is a combination of Adam and Eve. I was going to sort of pause, uh, try to make a sally towards um, Beowulf and Northern Epic, but I think if we go straight to Paradise Lost and Milton, mm. it'd be, I'd just to give it a bit more time, it's, because it's rummaging around very nicely, and I don't want to rush through Beowulf. We can come back to Beowulf on, on, on another day. Well, you said it's very interesting. Adam and Eve is a combination in Paradise Lost. Yes, that together they have all the, um, the qualities that a human being needs uh, to be happy, to be fulfilled. I think that's right. Success. Yeah, I John think, I, well, I do think that's right. I think that Eve's contribution um, is crucial, particularly after the fall. It's really Eve who thinks that they should go and beg forgiveness from God. Um, Adam says it's no good. When she, when she first suggests that, it says no good, no good. Um, but she insists and they do that, and that is the right thing to do. So she has a kind of wisdom which shows itself in adversity that Adam hasn't got. Just to go back two steps, though, John Curry, in what way was Paradise Lost, can you describe Paradise Lost as an epic, which will put it in the same brackets, as it were, <laughs> as Homer and Virgil. Paradise Lost is an anti-epic. Paradise, anti -epic. Paradise no, Lost no. is an anti-epic. Paradise Lost is an anti-epic. No one says, no. oh, no, so well, I, I'll say why I think it is, and then Gavin <laughs> can, can contradict me. But it seems to me that Milton thought epic was absolute nonsense. It's like going to watch football matches on Saturday, all this boys' stuff, you know, nonsense. He says that he's not going to write about that. He said he is not sedulous by nature to indict wars Hitherto the only argument, heroic deem, we're going to write about battle, for heaven's sake. You know about battle, he's going to write about the really important question, which is, what's wrong with human beings? It's the question that Freud asks and answers by reference to the psyche. It's the question that Marx asks and answers by reference to the economic system. Uh, Milton answers it by reference to their relation to God, they're disobedient and they trust passion and not reason. It's quite a good point. Um, reason is what we need in crises when we're faced with wars, not passion. Um, and it seems to me that that is completely different from the ancient epic. Of course he's saturated in the ancient epic, of course he's been brought up on it, of course he loves it, worships. Virgil and home, of course he does, and can never really cut himself off from it. So it seems to me one of the failures of Paradise Lost is that how you say, how does it actually overcome evil with a chariot? <laughs> 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 the Son of God rides over the 
fallen angels, throws them out of heaven with the chariot of the deity. Um, well, that is an ancient epic solution, but it shouldn't be, shouldn't be there. And in order to correct himself, he wrote another epic, Paradise Regained. No one has a chariot there. Christ is completely passive, doesn't lift a finger. He just wins by argument. I, I think I have <laughs> quite a different reading of Paradise Lost. <laughs> I would say that, um, first of all, um, I think Milton doesn't so much reject ancient epic as say that it, it is useful as a sort of model, but a model that needs to be surpassed. And it seems to me that Milton actually says the true epic action occurs in the human mind. Yeah. It's, our, it's where we make the decisions, where we make decisions and how we make them. That's the crucial action. So that I don't think that Milton is saying there's what is wrong with human beings. I think he's saying there's a great deal right with human beings. And even the fall, I think, in Paradise Lost is not presented as an unmitigated disaster. First of all, Milton's Christianity wouldn't have allowed his God to make such a mistake. But it seems to me that once Adam and Eve have fallen, then the question of making decisions, they still have to decide how to act, how to behave in a more shadowed world so that it's more difficult. One could say they become even more heroic after the fall because knowing how to know, knowing what to do, becomes so much more difficult. Uh, Oliver Tuplin, do you think that Milton did s succeed in Christianizing the epic? Um, yes, I mean that's, and I think it is epic, and I just wanted to take up John Kerry on that. It seems to me that his attitude is to make a, a model, a really rather an exaggerated model of epic, and then say, epic is actually what I don't like. So if I like something, if I like a long, <laughs> if I like a long narrative poem with a lot of speeches in it, and then. Uh, then I'm not going to call it epic. I, I suspect that people, uh, when they first heard the Odyssey, said, this isn't epic. This, this isn't about boys' games. Uh, this isn't about battle. Uh, the, the Odyssey, after all, doesn't fit your caricature of epic. And um, when Milton rejects martial epic, I think he's rejecting more Tasso and the uh, Italian mm, yes. uh, epics than he, than he is uh, Homer or Virgil. Virgil said, or uh, Augustus said, Latin is new. Uh, this is a new language. We are a new culture. We're not Greeks, and we've got to try and set up our own uh, thing to rival the great Homer at the because beginning. Because part of and that, you slightly yeah. missed out, is it helps to define a nation as well. It's a defining motion. Yes, I mean, I think it was in, uh, the Aeneid became very important yes. for Roman national identity. Um, but they, it's a very new culture. It's very, uh, it arrived very fast, suddenly took up over the whole of the Mediterranean, and eventually got to the point where it said, if we're going to be a real culture, we've got to have something of our own to be Homer, to be a rival to Homer. In the vernacular in English, uh, Milton's not the first attempt uh, to have a, a, something to rival Homer and Virgil. But one of the things that Paradise Lost is doing is saying, let us in English and let us in Christian terms have our own great narrative poem with its speeches, with its similes, which is something... Uh, I'd quite like to get to because I think they're, they're somehow characteristic of epic as well. Yeah. Well, if I had to take a character from Paradise Lost who I thought of as an epic character, I would take Satan. Yeah. Satan, it seems to me, is the epic hero. You know, courage never to submit or yield. That's an epic attitude, isn't it? What Milton says he is going to praise is the greater fortitude of patience and heroic martyrdom unsung before, he says, unsung by anyone, Ariosto, Virgil, Homer. It's not just talking about Italian epic. Uh, he's going to do a new thing. It's a Christian epic. Um, and I think that Satan is by far the greatest character in the poem. He's the only human character in the poem, totally human character, an amazing character, because he sees through himself. At the beginning of book four, when he's on Nifates' top and sees the beauty of the, uh, beauty of the universe, he looks into himself and he sees it's completely his fault. God is quite blameless. Nevertheless, he will fight God. Vengeance is what he wants. If it's love that God has, then love be cursed, because all it does is bring Satan pain. Wonderfully believable psychological character with real adulthood, which God in the poem never has. Now, I mean, Karen says that the poem 
uh, is not simple, and that's absolutely true. And I, and I entirely agree that part of Milton wants it to be an epic in the old form and does admire the old kind of epic. But another part of Milton is pitted against that. And I think Milton is a you know, highly complex poet, and that's why it's a great poem. You can't eventually say, who is, who is the hero? Christ is the hero, or Satan's the hero, or Adam and Eve together are the hero, or God is the hero. It doesn't work. It's not a simple poem. Is the, is the contrary... Does all this come from a deep contradiction between the classical pagan and the Christian? It comes from that contradiction, I think, yes, which is basic and I think Milton would see as quite unbridgeable. I think it also comes from a deep contradiction within Milton. That is to say, Milton is a Republican, of course, um, and yet he has to write a poem which has a supreme ruler who is unquestionable at its head, God, absolute ruler. Everything he does is, is by definition, right. That's very difficult. It's very difficult for Milton, who has spent his life, um, the last, later, later part of his life, before the, writing the poem, um, defending the, the execution of Charles I. And so what he does, it seems to me, is to... His psyche splits, and he, part of him goes into Satan the character who rebels against this supreme rule, part of him goes into hymning the goodness and glory of God, um, who is at the head of the poem. I think it is a very divided work. I'm a bit stuck here, to tell you the truth. Um, we could go on to move, try to move on to Wordsworth and interiorising the epic in the prelude, uh, but then we wouldn't get very far with um, near the modern modern time, U Joyce's Ulysses and then maybe Omeros de Orcott and maybe touching on the Western. So shall we just go straight to there? And Cervantes announces an epic novel, Tom Jones is an epic novel, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And we, but we've got Ulysses, so got a very couldn't be, a, couldn't be plainer in the face, could it? There's Joyce sitting down and saying, I'm doing the epic, it's in a day, it's in Dublin, it's about a, insofar as anybody is, an ordinary man, and, and here we go. So well, what, all it, what well it's an anti-epic. I mean, just yeah. as Fielding says yeah. that it's uh, the, the comic uh, epic in prose, uh, if, you, if you don't like epic, if you're going to insist that Homer is terribly grandiose, which is something that I really would want to question, um, that if you're going to insist that Homer is grandiose, then the uh, Ulysses is, is anti-Homeric, obviously. It's uh, a Jewish advertising agent with an unfaithful Penelope. Unless, Oliver, unless you said, as I would say, if Epic is trying to capture the defining, the controlling force of a culture, perhaps Joyce is saying the controlling force of our culture is that there is no controlling force. Therefore, material has to be organized in a completely different way. I keep coming back to yeah. my sense that the Epic has to, it shatters molds every time it's, it's, it's created. It has there is go, so much yeah, at stake. I would go along with you. I think and we're two against one on this, yes, actually. Yes, I think we are. Uh, and and <laughs> for anti-Epic, I would almost say anti-epic, you need to look to something like Ovid, to metamorphosis, to anything that is constantly changing its shape. That seems to me the anti-epic impulse. Yes, and Ulysses has a complex structure which in a very rough way follows the structure of, of the Odyssey. Um, but Joyce is, is very much not laying it on a template of Homer. No, just as Derek Walcott keeps on insisting that his oh, honor yeah. is not laid on a template of Homer. Um, and uh, people on Derek Walcott's behalf say, this isn't epic. And to call it epic is to assimilate it to battle, to assimilate it to white, European, male-dominated, etc. But uh, if we see epic as this kind of family resemblance uh, collection of works that break the mould in order to face the contemporary, I mean, I, uh, you know, I like what I've been hearing from Oxford. Then Oxford is uh, Karen. People <laughs> can't see this program. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then it seems to me that James Joyce and Omeros, in their different ways, uh, e even Philip Pullman, perhaps, is a kind of uh, if yes, it, uh, I, I could agree. bring in as a remaking of Milton, but a remaking yes. of Milton for for the concerns of the children and adults. Well, Milton they, is his uh, first epigraph, isn't it? Yes, it is yes, and yes. The, the titles yeah. are taken from Milton, and yeah. there's a mm, there's the war in heaven and so on that uh, is Miltonic. Well, there are two things, I think, that I'd just pick up there. I mean, one is that, that what 
Ulysses seems to me to be about is the movement of a mind. I mean, actually, it's an attempt to be realistic. And I think the words with, words with you, the words with James Joyce relationship is it's it's very, very close. I yeah. agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely so. The only difference being that Wordsworth makes his um, education and growth into a narrative, a recognisable narrative. As Karen says, that isn't there in Ulysses. We no longer believe in that we can really narrativize our lives. They're much more fragmentary and piecemeal than that. And so what you have is the so-called stream of consciousness technique in Joyce, just the movement of the human mind. Um, I, so breaking the mold, well, if breaking the mold is what makes epic, it does that. However, I would have thought there was one crucial difference between Ulysses and epic. Well, um, when Ol Oliver was talking earlier, he said that the epic audience was educated in those techniques of the singer. But the epic audience being educated in those techniques, by that he, not, he didn't mean he was an exclusive audience. I take it. He meant it was the people, everyone. They listened to the singer. They just recognized the techniques. They didn't realize they were educated, and they weren't. They couldn't read. This is very different, and Ulysses is completely different. Ulysses is an elitist work of high culture. And that, I mean, you can't, unless you cut the audience out of um, consideration altogether, you can't call it an epic, it seems to me. Epic is not written in that way. Where do you go from here, you two? Ma Karen. Well, I, I would disagree that, that Ulysses uh, is elitist. I mean, it seems to me that it, it is saying that the the hero, the heroic, is is the everyday person. And and also, when you think about the way Ulysses ends with, with Molly Bloom's wonderful uh, soliloquy, it seems to me it also is doing something about... It's, it's definitely undermining any notion that the epic has to do with, with maleness, Oh, of course, but I'm saying it's written for an elite... I mean, of course, of course it's saying we're in favour of the common man, except the common man can't read it. I mean, that's the paradox at the heart of Ulysses. Just as a very brief postscript, do you think that the Western, uh, which seems to follow the obvious rules, uh, the obvious uh, of the Iliad and the Odyssey, the, the films, the Western, the John Ford Western, is, can be, they can be called epics, the man riding in, martial changing society, standing for society, defining society, that sort of thing. Is it, can you include that in the word epic? Or that happens, right? well, there's, there's something of that, though. The epic film, again, I suppose, is capacious. Uh, been defined as, you know, the uh, simplest kind of movie to make madly. Um, but uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, or um, the, uh, there's a, a Troy in the making, uh, even at the moment. Um, oh, brother, where art thou? At the very beginning, they quote the Odyssey, and then the Coen brothers say, of course, we haven't read the Odyssey. It's actually what Derek Walcott says. Mm. Uh, it's all uh, based on Homer, and then in the course of the poem he says, I haven't read Homer. Mm -hmm. So it's this ambivalent uh, uh, attitude to tradition coming through again. Um, is the Western an epic? Well, yes and no. I mean, uh, in a... Karen, you're, you're <laughs> no. I think it isn't. I think it's a good... Westerns are good adventurous stories, but it seems to me their, their take on reality is too narrow. They, they're concerned with too, too small uh, a representation of the world as we know it. And it seems to me it, it's more... that possibly Westerns more related to pastoral, not epic. It seems to me it's that... it's, it's narrow. I think it's an way. epic, and I think that computer games are also epics. I think that's where it's gone. It's gone into popular literature, of course, since Wordsworth, high literature's had no time for it. Well, I think it's a question of when will you three meet again. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we've done all this work to prepare for this programme, and we've only used about a third of it. <laughs> There's two more programmes to come on, on the epic. Next week we'll be talking about chance and necessity in evolution. Meanwhile, thank you very much to Karen Edwards, John Carey, and Oliver Taplin, and thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.